Hi everybody, you're, you're all um, terrifically welcome to this uh, discussion about uh, home uh, with, uh, to coincide with the Science Gallery's current exhibition. My name is Ali Grehan, I'm the Dublin City Architect and I was uh, one of the guest curators for the home exhibition, which is now called Home Sick and I was uh, uh, just checking the Science Gallery's Twitter account earlier just to see what they were tweeting about because I thought they're obviously going to be tweeting about this wonderful panel discussion. They weren't. They were tweeting about the next exhibition which is Trauma and, and actually the uh, you know, e exhibits about housing could quite happily fit in an exhibition about trauma uh, because there is no question that uh, housing is an obsessive subject for us in Ireland. Uh, it's an addiction. And uh, we have a possibly a dysfunctional relationship with home, uh, with housing. And that's why the Science Gallery did decide to change the title of the exhibition from home to homesick, uh, because we wanted to interrogate it, all that issue in a playful way. But um, anyway, tonight we're going to just generally talk about um, I suppose the, the question for this evening was, how can architects help generate a new approach to how we create homes? And how do we keep people at the centre of the process? So being architects, we immediately decided, no, we didn't want to talk about that at all. Uh, we wanted to turn it on its head, and uh, we think it's much more appropriate to say, how can people help generate a new approach to how we create homes? and how do we keep architects at the centre of the process. Uh, the, uh, so we're going to explore that a bit later uh, in Sam and uh, Dominic's uh, uh, talks. And, and just to introduce you, I mean, we have Dominic Stevens here on, on my far right, and we've got Sam Bishop here on my right. And I will talk more about Dominic and Sam when I'm introducing their, their actual talk. But uh, in the, the Science Gallery wanted me to talk about, uh, they also wanted me to talk, uh, about a project uh, we, uh, we're doing in Dublin City Council, which you may have heard of. And it is, it is, it is very much, uh, this particular project is about uh, housing. And we are going to be holding an event in the Science Gallery on the 29th of June, uh, which I'll, I'll mention again at the end. But um, the Empowered City, uh, enabling people to activate neighbourhoods, uh, this was one of 16 issues we discussed at an event we held last November called Hidden Rooms. And the Hidden Rooms, hidden rooms if you go on www.pivot.com, you can find out all you want, uh, everything about Hidden Rooms. You can find out about the 16 issues. Uh, you can see short presentations that emerged from each of the workshops that were held on the 24th of no November. What we did was we invited 350 people from... Uh, all walks of life, uh, to come together in groups of about 20 um, people in each group. They were interdisciplinary groups, and we asked each group to uh, address a critical Dublin issue. Uh, the workshops were held in what we called hidden rooms, but these were different rooms around the city, because we wanted people to focus and speak in an intimate way uh, about uh, whatever it was they were discussing. For example, uh, some of the, one of the rooms was the Central Bank, the boardroom of the Central Bank, which was an incredible opportunity for people, uh, including housing activists, to get up to the top floor of the Central Bank and, uh, and discuss uh, how we uh, ensure quality in housing with uh, people from finance, uh, people, from, uh, people involved in making policy. The Empowered City is uh, an issue that is actually about apartment buildings, private apartment buildings. Now, why should Dublin City Council care about private apartment buildings? Well, one issue is private apartments. We have 65,000 uh, apartments or flats around the city now. It's an incredible number. A third of all homes in Dublin are uh, flats or bedsits. And most of those were built in the last 20 years. Uh, many of them are actually in very important parts of the city because they were in what we call urban renewal areas. So a lot of these uh, apartments were built with, uh, uh, prompted by tax incentives. But they would be in high-profile parts of the city, like the Liffey Keys, for example. Um, 
the problem is that we don't really uh, n we don't really know how to properly live in apartments in Dublin. We only uh, instigated uh, management systems for apartment living in 2011 when the MUDS Act was passed, the Multi-Unit Development uh, Act. So we have a kind of a vast array of apartment buildings around the city. Some are, some are fine, some are very uh, good quality, some are very poor quality. Uh, the earlier ones are maybe uh, the ones that would have been built in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, are tiny. They tend to be very, very tiny. Uh, the, the later ones, the ones that were built as we were approaching the, I suppose, the height of the, of the and, and just before the collapse of the, 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 boo, the Celtic Tiger, are maybe built to more generous space standards, but maybe they're not so well built. And I suppose a very high profile example, of course, is Priory Hall. But um, uh, that is an extreme example. Uh, so we're, you know, we're not going to. Uh, I, I'm not saying that that is in any way the norm. But people do have different issues with apartment buildings, and they find it very hard to address those issues because of the high level of interdependency that's required uh, with apartment living. And we just don't. We're, not, we're just not used to it. So what we wanted the group in this workshop, the Empowered City, to do was to devise a pilot project that would could help address the challenge of private apartment living. Uh, we'll design better and build better uh, apartments in the future. What about the 65,000 apartments we have at the moment? Our bed sits. Um, we had a guest speaker in every room and they, their job was to inspire us with an idea. And our guest speaker is a guy called jo Joel Mills. Uh, he works for the American Institute of Architects. and. Uh, he runs a particular program called the Design Action Program. And uh, it, was, it began in 1967, and it was inspired by the civil rights movement. And it's, been, it's played out in, in neighborhoods, towns, villages, cities around the, around the states. And essentially what they do is they, uh, they form a group, a small group of uh, experts, in different fields, they're invited by a community to come into the community and working with the people in the community. It's very important that they're invited in. That's, that's, that's the first principle. Uh, working with the, the, the group uh, in the community, they, they develop a master plan over about four days, a master plan and an implementation strategy, and the community that have invited them in. They may be facing a complete crisis. The, the town might have been flattened by a, a tornado or something, or it could be something else entirely. Maybe, it is, uh, maybe it's a suburban area, and it's, uh, it's just the, there is no, no centre. Uh, there is no commercial centre anymore. There are no shops. Uh, so they, the, com the challenges are different, but uh, what this group do is they develop a master plan, an implementation strategy, and the community take that implementation strategy and start rebuilding the community. So it's very American, it's very can-do. Uh, the, the crucial thing is there has to be a clearly mapped out set of steps that people can address, escalating steps of ambition. And uh, they, they have actually managed to, uh, to uh, help 200 uh, communities around the states do really dramatically impressive things. So, when I asked Joel to come over to speak at, for the Empowered City, I said, we, I said, well, we don't have places that have been flattened by tornadoes, but um, we do seem to have a real problem with apartment buildings. And I thought he'd laugh, and uh, I thought he'd say, well, well, you know, that's nothing. But uh, he was very curious, and he, he came over. And the, uh, maybe we were kind of steering the discussion for the Empowered City across, uh, throughout the day, but we did decide at the end of the day that it would be great to set up a design action team pilot program in Dublin, where maybe we could test this idea uh, working with a group of apartment uh, residents and owners, but residents primarily. Uh, I, took the, uh, I took the idea to the apartment owners network, thinking that they too would find this completely hilarious, um, that uh, uh, that a uh, group of uh, do-gooders would want to work uh, in doing a master plan, how, how you could, might address your apartment complex, make it a, a really great place to live. But they didn't find it, uh, they, they thought this was terrific. And uh, uh, they, they really want to do this. 
because apparently it is still a problem uh, for people. And I, I'm sure many of you living in apartments may actually think, yes, it is, it is a problem. We could, uh, you know, I like my home, but it could be so much better. One thing that was really striking about what the group, uh, the Apartment Owners Network group said was, they, they weren't so much focused on, on the immediate problems in their, in their buildings. What most distressed them was their lack of connectivity with their immediate neighbourhood and how, how, uh, how they just didn't see, feel that they were part of a neighbourhood, part of a, a, a bigger community. Uh, because that's very much how we designed, have designed apartments. We think that's what people want. We think that they want to live in gated communities. Maybe people don't want to live in gated communities. Uh, but the, uh, another interesting point, and it was made time and time again during our workshop, was that the solutions to our apartments, uh, solutions to our homes generally, are found in the wider community. They don't necessarily have to be found in our home, in our home, within our four walls. That is one part of our problem. We seem to think that our solution has to be within our four walls. And we, that's why we keep extending our homes and extending them and extending them, thinking that that's the route to happiness. And maybe that isn't the route to happiness. Maybe it's something else. Um, so we are going to establish a uh, trial this. Uh, Joel is coming back in. Uh, towards the end of June uh, to run, uh, to train some potential volunteers uh, who might like to form a design action team. It is a voluntary program. Why will people do it? I think when we talk about what architecture can do for society, I think people do want to give back. And uh, people are happy to share their expertise in helping uh, a community you know, improve. And uh, another very important principle is that if uh, the people who volunteer for this program cannot get any work out of it, so they cannot go in there, advise a group, and then end up designing the town library. No, they can't do that. It is, it, 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 there, there can be no financial gain. Uh, so that's a, some, a principle we'll be sticking to. Um, that's, look, that's photos from our, our, our workshop. That's Joel down on the bottom left-hand corner. He's a friendly guy. And um, he's really excited about coming back to Dublin and he thinks it's a very, very interesting uh, issue because he likes, the, he likes the title. He likes the title Empowered City. First speaker here is, uh, or the next speaker is Dominic, Dominic Stevens. And um, Dominic Stevens Architects was founded in 1995 and since then have consistently made cutting-edge contemporary architecture projects specialising in recent years in buildings in the Irish landscape. Dominic will speak about Irish Vernacular, a project created to spark a change in house design and build and share open source designs for, for a home with a total construction cost of €25,000. Um, so Dominic's going to talk about what the motivation for this project is um, and why he wants to share his expertise uh, openly. Uh, and then I think we'll go back and we'll talk about wider issues. Um, <clears throat> so I suppose, like, the first slide I'm showing here is an Irish vernacular house, which you'd all recognise and has a certain kind of image about it that we all understand. Uh, it's interesting to me in that uh, it's, it's something that's very honed to the landscape that it's in, and it's really very sophisticated in its use of the, ava the materials available. And... Uh, whatever about putting architecture in the centre of the process, these are obviously buildings that had no architects and yet are extremely sophisticated. And that happened through evolution and I became very interested in evolution, uh, so things that, are, that evolve as opposed to things that are designed. So a house like this really is as sophisticated as it is because families over generations and generations, over thousands of years, uh, if you built good houses and you knew how to do it, your family thrived, and if you didn't, your family might die out. So that way, like any evolution, uh, you get better at doing the thing that you're doing. This house is in the west of Ireland, so you can see its roof is very streamlined and it's all tied down, so it you know, deals with high winds, whereas a house in the Midlands would have an overhanging roof to look after the mud walls that were kind of more normal in the, in the Midlands. So I, I was interested in these as an architect, but not quite knowing as a contemporary architect trying to kind of build houses, what that might mean to me. And uh, this was one of my kind of analyses of these type of houses. And what it is, you can see on, on the left-hand side, uh, there's 
different materials available. Most of the materials for houses like this come from the immediate area. And uh, through kind of man's agency or, you know, the things we do, those materials are moved around. So the house becomes a kind of a process of just moving materials from one place to another in order to make a small area more comfortable or safer or more useful for man. So that's at the root of, you know, really all architecture is just moving things around. Um, and it's clear within that that uh, nothing is exiting the community. With They're, they're not reliant on a, a mortgage or borrowing money, or they're not even reliant on expertise coming into the community. They are reliant on each other, and that kind of reliance is what sticks communities together, because there's a certain um, pleasure with being uh, self... Um, you know, being able to stand on your own two feet and not being reliant on your neighbours, but that reliance is what makes communities happen. So uh, that form of housing doesn't just house people, but it knits communities together and makes people interdependent. Uh, so that was that's very different to, I suppose, the way that uh, housing happens now, where on that slide you have the architect dreaming of this fancy house, um, the client who just wants a house to live in, and then the builder who's thinking <laughs> about money. And, and that's, and excuse, and excuse the stereotypes. Uh, but what it's to do with is a housing system that's really to do with the creation of wealth. And, uh, you know, our housing is created from the market and people make money out of it. So during the Celtic Tiger, every house that cost 300,000 euros for one person to buy, which was the av about the, uh, 330,000 euros was the average house price. 100,000 of that went directly to the government in the form of development levies, taxes, VAT, and all that stuff. So as we all know, like that's well trodden at this point. Uh, housing is a, is a way that you can, in the, certainly in the short term, create a lot of money out of nothing, or certainly out of a lot of increasing private debt. So that's a very different system that's to do with reliance between people and experts, but particularly the reliance on money and borrowing. And so I was trying to learn from the first example and uh, avoid, avoid this, because I, I needed a house which kind of coincided with, I, became, I was separated, uh, it was the end of the Celtic Tigery kind of time, and I had to have a house and I had 25,000 euros. So I started telling people I was going to build a house for 25,000 euros, and I told enough people that then I was shamed into kind of having to do it. <laughs> um, and so this was the house, which is a simple, it, I, I, it's in uh, County Leitrim, and it's a very simple uh, house-shaped thing, which, and it's house-shaped ultimately because I found out that was the best use of the material. So most of the decisions in this house really came through uh, me having the time to uh, go through what everything was going to cost. And, and, my recent, and my experience really over the years of designing houses, I ended up designing lots of houses for people without very much money, um, kind of by chance. It was the people I knew. And, and that uh, made me, uh, kind of helped me develop my innate stinginess and uh, know how to, you know, to know what costs money and what doesn't cost money. So, uh, you know, it's very basic. And it's as cheap as that because I built it myself um, with help of my girlfriend, neighbours and friends. And so uh, I ended up not being reliant on the bank, but being kind of reliant and beholden to a community of people. Um, so that's just images of what it looks like. So it is very simple and quite small, it's 60 square meters, so it's the size of a two-bedroom flat in town. Um, but a lot of, I put a lot of energy into making one big, very spacious room and, and having kind of uh, cozy-sized um, bathrooms and bedrooms and things. So that was a process of building, uh, which is really learned from Walter Segal, who was a self-building kind of guru in the 60s and 70s, or 70s and 80s really in London, and he was kind of sick of working in the kind of tripartite relationship that I described first, um, earlier on in the earlier slide, and so he started working with people who wanted to build their own houses, and ended up building uh, small developments of council housing uh, with people from the housing list building their own houses, which o over the last 20, 30 years have played out in an extremely successful way that everyone's very invested in where they live, uh, and look after it and, you know, it's, it's helped form, form very, you know, good communities. So having done that and being f 
beholden to my friends who helped me, I felt like I had to give something back and also learning from the vernacular where the kind of knowledge of how to build a house was shared in common. Uh, I made this website where you could download information that would certainly get you on the way to building the house yourself. So there's a series of uh, building instructions, photographs of how it happens, and they can all be, when you go to that site, irishvernacular.com, you can download those things for free. And in a way, that's, it gets a huge amount of hits, and people are very interested in it. And a number of people have contacted me to say they're building one. And there's, you know, initially, unsurprising, not surprisingly, a lot of Spanish and Greek people were contacting the site and wondering, did I think it would work in Greece and Spain? And uh, would they make it white to reflect the heat? Because here it's black to absorb the heat. And, uh, but more than anything, the kind of comments I was getting on the, on the blog attached to it were, you know, it, most of the people who are going to do it are probably people who would be, have a bit of knowledge in the area, or, but it empowered them to realize that, yes, this is possible. And uh, so the sharing of information is to do with the nuts and bolts sharing of how to do it, but also to do with the sharing of possibility. That if you can go and do this, like building your own house makes your life a misery for about two years. Um, and uh, it, but you know, at the end of it, it's worth it because it's extremely empowering. And I think especially, um, uh, yeah, like, you know, as a man that you feel like you can build a house and your family has a house, you know, that's an empowering thing for, well, men and women, whoever. But uh, men like to be empowered by that kind of stuff. So uh, I did that and um, kind of put it out there. And part of the reason as well was to do with this thing of evolution. And software design uh, has developed at a pace unlike any other kind of design ever, really. And that's through the creation of wikis, where, you know, as we all know, Wikipedia is something that's kind of produced by a huge amount of people, and there's a lot of information on it. Uh, wikis were first developed by software engineers to share information. So they'd have a project they'd half done, they didn't know what to do with it. They'd put it on a wiki, and somebody they didn't know would start collaborating with them. And through that, evolution has kind of speeded up through the size of you know, the population of the world, which is also often seen as a kind of a negative thing. There's too many of us, but if there's all those people and we're all collaborating, maybe we can speed up evolution. So that was the kind of sense I wanted to get with this house as well, that this website, that you're kind of having speeded up evolution, which, you know, kind of works. And Sorry, I didn't know that was going to be there. Oh, yeah, that was an example of the kind of building instructions that are there that you kind of follow step by step. So coming out of that, I started getting people coming back to me. This was a construction studies, a Leaving Cert student who made a big model of the house and as his Leaving Cert project and, you know, came back to me with ideas about things I'd done wrong or ideas he had, which is, yeah, which is great. And then an, another example, somebody in, in, in Italy who made a very complicated sketch-up model of the house and started suggesting new ways of kind of using panels uh, that would have been common in, in, in Italy. So through that, the kind of the kind of the production of culture, uh, the kind of culture of how you make houses increases somehow. So then I'm left uh, kind of thinking, you know, so that I've created myself a house, I've shared something, and uh, there's, you know, I, what I, my ambition, I worked in Berlin early in my career and I was working exclusively in housing, and what I'd really love to be doing is making housing on, you know, on a larger scale for people. And so I, I was lucky enough that uh, somebody had seen my website and was kind of interested in it, had a background of working with uh, St. Vincent de Paul and, and saw, saw another potential for it. So that ended up being, he put together a very, um, are you in the room, Niall? No, okay. I just, uh, um, he put together a complex arrangement whereby uh, he had enough money to buy a house in County Dublin um, and he's using that same amount of money, which is around 300,000. Uh, to build five houses. And he's able to do that because they're being self-built by all the people that are going to live in them. So he's going to live in one of those houses. Uh, three of them are going to be lived in by people from the housing list, and one of them is going to be sold back to the county council as affordable housing. So that's the kind of plan. He's got a hugely complex, you can imagine, mechanism to, uh, to, to, to do that, and has had to, he's a very persuasive, charismatic person. He's managed to bring a whole load of different parties on board and uh, 
So he, what he sees, he gets out of that, is living in something that is going to feel like a real community because the experience of these types of projects in other countries is where people work together, building their houses together, a community is formed. We managed to make a project that has a kind of a shared space where that kind of community can happen. So almost like a small private-public partnership, uh, he's getting a house. Uh, three people from the housing list will be owning their own house um, outright, albeit with covenants that mean that they can't sell it back to the market and make money out of it. And, and then there's an extra house that the, 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 the county council can use in their affordable housing stuff. So, uh, so society's getting, getting uh, much more through really Niall's ingeniousness and uh, his, his ability to understand bureaucracy and deal with people, I think. And then, so that's just an image of it that shows this kind of public space. It's a terrace of five houses that even though they look quite different to my own house, it's exactly the same system of building that Walter Segal developed and is, is very approachable by, by people with very little building experience. Um, so that's in the process of, about, it's about to go in for planning. The, whatever about you know, designing that or thinking up the way that that might be built, really the most creative part of a project like this in the developed world now is how it fits within a kind of the regulatory framework that's in place at the time where you want to do it. And there's all kinds of potential roadblocks and impediments to that to do with, you know, building regulations, health and safety. There's a whole range of things. And I, I, so at the moment, architecture has become so complex and broad that I think it's very important for architects to work with other architects who are good at complementary different things. And so I'm working uh, with another architecture practice called Open Architects on this, and they made this amazing, they're, they're, uh, they're interested in regulation and uh, uh, the kind of potential of, you know, the, the regulations in place don't stop you from doing stuff. So this is a kind of a, a, a spreadsheet that goes through exactly step by step how this project can happen, what needs to happen in a regulatory way at the different steps. So that's the really uh, creative bit of the project, really. And then I have slides of the house at the end, but so the, which don't really, there's not a lot within this conversation to talk about, other than they're, they're straightforward and they're designed to be extremely flexible, so that um, they fit a three-bedroom house, but uh, a lot of the walls inside it, because it's a frame building like my own, the walls aren't load-bearing, so that you can decide where they go and over the years change them, because I think it's very important to realise you know, a house isn't so much as a product or a fixed thing. If you're going to live for a long time in a house, it has to be an adaptable thing, a bit like, you know, we deal with our clothes, taking coats off, putting coats on, you know, wearing particular things for particular times. On a different time scale, uh, a house for a couple with two small children is very different than a house for a couple with two teenage children or a couple once their children have left home. So that, that kind of level of adaptability is, is, is built into the design. So I suppose like that's to do with a journey of so it's kind of looking at vernacular houses, working out what that means, and through me making my own house and constantly, I suppose, engaging with other people and talking about it and involving them, that you would then end up with something that uh, isn't, you know, self-building small developments of houses isn't uh, the solution to our housing needs, or but it's you know one one part of a lot of different pieces of a jigsaw. That, uh, that, that, you know, solves problems and, and uh, allows housing to happen or be imagined in, a, in, a, in another way. So I think that that's, gets me to the end Thank, of that. Thanks, Dominic. Um, we, di we did talk a lot uh, uh, earlier before the, the discussion hap um, started so officially uh, about how uh, in Berlin or Amsterdam uh, uh, and other cities, this kind of approach is the norm. There's mm. nothing eccentric yeah. about it, really. And, the, and it's just one of many ways of achieving what you need. Uh, that, um, whereas in Ireland, we seem to have a one-size-fits-all approach to housing, which is possibly the most complex, one of the most complex and important places uh, that we will ever be in. And, and yet, it, uh, we think that there are only a couple of ways of doing it. And, uh, we still, and uh, we can talk maybe later about why that is, but mm. it's certainly a problem. Uh, the, and it does, but it does go back to the, the first point. The only way this is going to change is if people 
actually demand it, want it to change. Uh, architects going, uh, going out there and saying um, there must be greater diversity or different approaches or whatever, so it's self-serving uh, it, and, and it will be discounted. Uh, ultimately, the only way that people will get um, just a richer, a, a richness in how we provide and make homes is if people want this, if people demand it and, and look for more. It is happening in, in other cities, it is the norm. And, uh, uh, and, and we need to make it the norm too. So it leads me to the next speaker, um, Sam Bishop, who says uh, he wants to go back to architecture. And we said, but you are an architect. Uh, Sam did st uh, studied architecture, but now coordinates happenings. I don't like the but. Sam, Sam studied architecture and as an architect coordinates happenings, a Dublin events company specializing in open air cinema, music and community events in public space. He's a founder member of Upstart, the arts collective that built Granby Park, which was a temporary park in Dublin city centre in 2013. He's co-founder and coordinator of Street Feast, the national day of street parties. And so Sam's going to talk about Granby Park. It's, uh, very, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but the story and the legacy of the project and what the outcomes have been. I know that it's, it hasn't been, you have experienced disappointments as well as um, positives and how your, I suppose, training as an architect helps you coordinate these events and why it gives you, I think, it gives you a unique perspective on public space. Yeah. Oh. Great, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Um, so, um, I, um, as you will now understand, I generally work in between the homes, as in I, I kind of, a lot of my uh, practice is actually in public space um, or in spaces which aren't necessarily where people actually live, but um, those spaces in between. And so what I'm going to talk to you about is a bit of my, the practice that I work, have been working on in the last few years. Um, and um, so I came back to Ireland in 2010, um, having finished my kind of part two of architecture, and um, kind of got stuck into just volunteering, and uh, I'd never lived in Dublin before. Um, started getting involved in loads of different projects w in public space. Um, and so I'm going to run you through a few of those. Um, this is, um, I'm going to, basically my main part of it is, is Grammy Park. Grammy Park uh, was a project that we did in 2013 uh, with Upstart, which was an arts collective. We'd already done a project before, which was um, to reinvent um, the election posters during the general election in 2011. I don't know if you remember uh, these posters on lamppost. We put up a thousand posters by different artists and writers. Um, this might be on a timer, I'm not sure. Um, so, um, basically, um, our next project was to bring that work into a, a, um, a space, to turn a private space into a public space, to turn something which was vacant into something full of life. Um, and so we created Grammy Park. Um, this was a, um, a DCC-owned site, um, and it was a site which was due for regeneration. So it was one of the failed public-private partnership projects. Uh, and so the residents which are, uh, who live in the uh, flats with, where this photograph are taken, where this photograph is taken from, there used to be flats there and they were to be knocked down and then new apartments built. Um, due to the crash, um, that never materialized and at the moment the funds are still with the Department of the Environment. So we thought there was a great opportunity to, um, to um, experiment, to build something different to try something out. Um, so, uh, th and this mainly was about trust. It was about getting all stakeholders involved. It was about working with uh, huge amounts of different people um, and ensuring that the community was at the heart of it. And I guess what you will find is that for Grammy Park, the main thing for us was about what the community, who, who, who was, um, that the community were at the center and that they had a say and that uh, what they wanted actually happened. Um, these are photos of our, of our collaboration and our, so this is us using our, our past election posters um, as flower beds because we could only get in there for a month. We needed to actually um, plant things beforehand. Uh, another part of our project was um, to work with, um, uh, I'm going to pause that a second and bring that forward there, to work with uh, lo local youths from um, the flats who used to live on those in those flats, but also to work with um, uh, pallets, which are 
a kind of ubiquitous material which are found on all the street corners around there at the markets area, um, to reinvent them. So we worked with, um, these people here are uh, youth from Belfast and from Dublin, and they uh, worked together. The kids from Northern Ireland were loyalist kids who had great skills in building with pallets to build these bonfires, which you'll see here. So to actually um, turn something which is a, a symbol of sectarianism into a symbol of creativity, we, um, we worked with Sean Harrington Architects to build a, an amphitheater at the end. So we kind of split this project into different sections and worked with different architects who worked completely voluntarily to create various spaces. Um, and um, for me, that was such a, a valuable part of the project, to involve 500 volunteers in total over the course of the project, which in itself was massive, but to, um, to involve every, like, um, professionals, local businesses, um, the residents, and local communities. Um, so A2 Architects, if you can see there, um, this is the, the communal space, the gathering space, um, the, the alternative community center, um, which was um, three um, polytunnels, uh, which were floored, um, and this was the place where people could eat, um, they could learn, and uh, the trade school was there where there was education um, shared uh, for, um, not for money, but for barter. Uh, this is the amphitheater here. So this was a, uh, the brief was a 300 person amphitheater with recycled materials, um, and which was to be built by 15 year olds. And the, I guess the reason why it, it never stayed was because we only had a month to use the site because it was due to be regenerated. It was also because it was a voluntary project, we didn't have the capacity to continue it. And um, our main aim was to kind of provoke and to, and to show what could be done with the community and to show um, how um, things could be in Ireland. How, like, in many ways, this, was, this area in Dublin is actually a, a place where there's not that many green spaces. Um, you find so many more green spaces down in Dublin too. And so to um, put something in there and to say, well, uh, is this what could work here? Is this um, what should happen in this neck of the woods or on these vacant sites which are happening around the city and around the country? So since then, um, I've noticed that there's quite a few people have come to me to, or come to Upstart to ask for um, their, for kind of a blueprint or a model for building it in their uh, city. Uh, and in some ways, we failed in that respect in that we had never managed to pull together a, a toolkit, which was the kind of the intention to, de to show people. But in some ways, we kind of felt that this was a, such a one-off project um, that uh, the toolkit would almost be meaningless. And, and in some ways, it needs to be a much bigger toolkit with many, many projects, which would actually... Um, be more diverse, and it would actually give people more because they could actually pick and choose. Um, so um, I, we can talk about it more. Um, the work that I'm mainly working on right now is Happenings, which is about animating our public spaces. Um, so you, you might have heard about them, but they are uh, open air uh, cinemas, open air music. We use Dublin City Council spaces. Um, uh, Peter O'Brien is the founder, and I now coordinate this. Um, and we, our home is basically around here, actually. It's Merrion Square, uh, Dartmouth Square, Fitzwilliam Square. But we're also up in uh, the north side on Friday. We're in Rathmines on Thursday. And our, I guess the exciting thing that we found is that we can work with technology to animate public space very quickly. So we now, uh, we announced uh, yesterday evening that we're showing an event on uh, Thursday, and we have 1,500 to 2,000 people who are already signed up to come to that event. So the idea that we uh, plan events way in advance in our, the weather that we have seems to be an archaic way of doing things. And so to change the way that we uh, come together as communities can change now um, through, our, through, the, through our phones and our technology. Um, but also, for example, um, uh, this was when Robin Williams died. Uh, we put on a film uh, three days later, um, Dead Poets Society, and we, we, because we were able to work in a kind of a, um, a lightweight way, but also we felt this was an opportunity to talk about the issues of mental health. So we worked with charities to, to bring our community, our audience together to talk about mental health and suicide. And, um, and, and in some ways, using our public spaces and the spaces in between our homes to gather and to um, express an emotion. So um, by the end of the film, everybody, the whole 
park was crying, and they, everyone stood up, and uh, I don't know if you've seen the end of the film, but they all said, shouted, my cap- um, oh, captain, my captain. It was so powerful. Um, and, and, and maybe our spaces are, can be used for this, and this is what we'd like to explore more. Um, so we do... Um, we use other parks for yoga. We now have 150 people coming to a yoga class. Um, people want to use these spaces, but we need to animate them in new ways. Um, this is North Great Georgia Street, which we are uh, going back to animating in two weeks uh, for Bloomsday Brunch. But it's just to show you examples of how we uh, work in between on our streets. And this is Street Feast, which is uh, coming up uh, in 10 days next Sunday week, um, a national day of street parties, which we started about six years ago. And I guess. Coming into Ireland, I, I was actually doing my final year project in architecture, and I kind of felt that um, we had all these community um, centers, but actually I didn't feel we needed to build more concrete and glass. We actually needed to um, uh, work with people to, to um, curate the spaces in between. And so Street Feast is very simple. It's basically just sharing food non-commercially um, on on the streets. Um, and so next week we'll have about 200 people, 200 communities across the country having food on their streets together without any money. And, and it kind of feels like a little start of a conversation because in some ways people need an excuse to knock on someone's door and say, hi, I actually live next door. Um, do you want to... Um, uh, do you want to meet or do you want to even... I just want to say hello to you. Um, that kind of is almost weird now. And so to have an invite and to say, here, well, this, this is happening all around the country. Why don't we do this? Seems to be um, one way that we can start to um, breaking down the barriers. Uh, th- this is simply two slides, which uh, a recent project, that, a very small project that we did. But I just wanted to include it because this has been happening in Dolphin's Barn where we... Uh, this is my girlfriend... Um, wall beside her house, which was a a complete eyesore. And um, it kind of felt like it was dragging the whole street down. And so um, she basically just asked some of the the local neighbors to come and paint uh, a wall. And it was that simple. She'd missed the street feast day. She hadn't managed to organize another kind of event. And she felt that she could do something. Why not um, change the space? And so uh, the idea was to create a community cinema. So it's the Dolphin Barn. I, think, I can't remember the actual name, but it's like the Dolphin's Barn Community Cinema. And um, so we showed films there. Uh, and it was just great because the kids were able to come out. And now these kind of little events actually act as a, a, fo- a focus for people to converse. So now when people go down the street, I've just heard from different people that it's a matter of going, oh, so when's the street feast? Or when are we going to have another film? Or when are we going to do that? And th- that conversation might not have happened otherwise. So... I'd love to maybe kind of, where does that fit in this conversation? I'm not so sure, but um, I think that uh, hopefully we can discuss how these kind of things can actually animate space and, um, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not really sure where where to end on that. I guess for me, um, what I'd love to see and what um, we really explored in uh, Granby Park was the creation of new... Um, community gathering spaces. So um, the church um, was, used to be a community gathering space. The pub is a, is a, a traditional um, gathering space. A community center is a traditional gathering space. But actually, for many of us, they might not be relevant or they might not be the place that we associate with. What, what are we doing now to actually build our third space? We have our homes, we have our work, but what is that space? Is it the shopping center? It, at the moment, it seems that all we're doing is building commercial spaces for people to gather. And I'd argue that we need to relook at how we create those gathering spaces so that um, we live in a city or in a society that, is, that we're kind of, we feel comfortable in and that isn't about always spending. Yeah, we're going to open it up to the audience in a minute, but um, Dominic, what do you think about that? I, to me, that's the, like, it's the thing that happens, and I think you alluded to it in the, when you were talking, like or directly we're talking about it actually, the thing that happens in between people's houses and that relationship between house and city and where we all get on with one another is extremely important. And, uh, and more and more in Dublin, those places are commercial. You, you, know, you have to buy a cup of coffee. Um, there isn't somewhere for you to just go. And that was the amazing thing when Granby Park happened. And, 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 and I think, like you were talking about, the kind of lack of, you know, you felt sorry that you hadn't made a toolkit, but in a way the toolkit is the empowerment of everyone who went there who realised, oh yeah, you can actually do that. And that's, that's 90% of it. 
And, um, but I, I think those spaces, both at the, kind of, at the level of the design of, of, an, of an apartment building, the kind of other places, once you go outside your door, where you meet other people, what those places feel like, and that has a huge bearing on how you can relate to those people and how you, know, how you become good neighbours. Um, I, could t uh, yeah, I, I have, a very, I have yeah. a very quick story I can yeah, tell. I designed, um, when I was in Berlin, some of the houses we design, housing we designed was kind of two rows of four-storey housing with a big uh, industrial glazed roof over the middle of it. So there was a garden in the middle. And the, in the middle of the garden, and the one that I didn't design, the first one that's, that the office I worked in, it, there was a big, quite ugly spiral staircase, and you went up the spiral staircase to get to your apartments. And then I got my hands on the next kind of generation of them, and I got rid of that ugly staircase, and I took the staircase in, so you could go, you could choose to go into the central space, but you could also get to your apartment another way. And myself and my boss visited the two buildings 10 years later, and the one with the spiral staircase in the middle, we knocked on doors and everyone was saying, oh, it's such a great place to live. And, you know, there's a Christmas tree in the middle and they were having mm. parties and they babysat for each other. And it was just, oh, you know, what great architects we are. And, and then we went to the <laughs> next one, the one that I was involved in. And everyone was kind of peering out of doors and kind of saying, no, I don't really know our neighbours. And there's that space in the middle of it. And I don't know what it's for. <laughs> and, you know, and all... Uh, all we'd done, they didn't have to meet one another. They could choose to meet one another in this lovely space, or they could choose to creep down the side and go into their apartment. And I think architects really need to encourage people through kind of good design to meet people. And that's at the scale of kind of an apartment building. And then in the city, uh, what Sam is doing, I think that's exactly the same. And it's to do with, uh, you know, places where that can happen, but a kind of empowerment that people can want to have a party on a street and have a party on a street or, you know, you can have a park or... And that's back to you reversing the, the kind of statement at the beginning of this, that it, it's generated by people being empowered that the city is theirs and they want to do this and knocking on people's doors and saying, why can't we do it? And to me, that's the, that's the very middle of it. And you've taken that space and shown other people that that is, you know, mm. that's what the city is for. Arguably, like, when you... Um, I grew up thinking that... Uh, the street for was for well, it, the street was the place where I was told what not to do. So this was the place where I got told off by the guards or by my parents or by someone for like messing. And it, it kind of it changes our like that relationship with the with the street and with our space outside of our walls uh, is kind of damaging. For, like, that must kind of lead on into how we use our space mm. uh, and how we care for it. So. Um, yeah, the, um, the, we have architectural criteria in our development plan, and I'm not, I'm not completely veering off topic here, the, um, but uh, they're, they're a bit, um, they're, they're quite abstract, but uh, uh, one of them, and it was the one I thought it, it is the most important, is um, generosity, and that, I've, I, and I've, t I've talked about this before, but the, and it's, it's what, you've both been speaking about, and, and Dominic, you were describing there in that apartment building, uh, that um, the need to actually create these memorable moments, they don't, uh, by generosity we don't mean large, oh, it's a very generous uh, home because it's large, it could be bleak and barren and, 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 and soulless, uh, but uh, no, generosity in, the crea in, in dealing with functional requirements in a beautiful way, joyful way, so allowing places for people to meet, uh, allowing sunlight, uh, in, uh, doing all these things, but th thinking about what you're doing, making it a generous, beautiful uh, experience. But um, that, and I think that's the, the missing quality in, in home design now. Uh, do we have a final question or will we just give a round of applause to our speakers? <laughs>